Connect with nature? I'll tell you how we did it. We took time off, very important, camping, fishing, hiking, exploring, rock collecting, fossil hunting, lizard chasing, mountain climbing, bird watching. We learned the plants, we named the animals, we went hunting for wildflowers, we hiked up creeks, we went rowing, I sketched and painted, we did photography, we did mapping, compass reading, cloud watching, very important, and stargazing, and just sitting. We watched animals, we recorded their behavior, we went out in different weather, wet weather, dry weather, windy, cold, warm, stormy, balmy. We became familiar with habitats and plant communities and favorite places. We, be, we, <laughs> we have our favorite places. When we traveled, we named the wildlife zones. So in order to connect with nature, you have to be there and you have to pay attention and you need to take another look and listen. Disorder will melt away and you will discover you are part of a community of life. You'll have a sense of place and you will belong. When you do that, you learn nature's ways, such as everything is connected and everything goes somewhere, so don't just leave things behind, they're not going to disappear. And natural systems know best, we should remember that culturally. And also, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everybody has a role to play, everybody contributes, everybody has an influence of some kind. So living in the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, there's nothing like a personal experience. Well, sketching and painting were my main activities. And focusing on one landscape or even a single flower or a pine cone was my way of paying closer attention. It was a pleasure. It was great enjoyment. It increased my vision. I see more things in the sky than I ever did before, more colors in the clouds. And it improved my skills. Then along the way, I discovered something that I didn't know before, flow patterns, because they were central to the way things look. And I had to use them in my drawings. So nobody ever told me about flow patterns before. It was all geometric in school, I think because it goes with the math. But I collected the flow patterns that I saw in nature. First of all was curving flow, and then branching patterns, spirals, radial, waves, ripples, and meanders. And this is not just a wandering line. A meander is a specific scientific designation where water runs across a flat plain uh, with a very uh, low incline, so it goes very slowly. And it makes an S shape uh, back and forth and a really regular configuration, and it's fun to find them. The first picture I'd like to show you as an example is the a uh, pastel sketch of the great sand dunes. And you can see it just looks like wave upon wave upon wave. And it's amazing how mountains start to look like waves when you can see them like this where they start at a very low elevation and go very, very high. I also did another uh, dune painting when I was up on the dunes. It's just a, a color study, really. But again, it shows how I use those long flowing lines to contour the dunes and show the shapes. I got so fascinated with flow patterns and I started seeing them everywhere in nature. And all of these, um, I tried to put on one page. I have several pages, but I just brought one. This is of turbulent flow that shows the radial patterns on the top of what's flowing. And you'll see in the top picture on the left-hand side, it's clouds. And it looks like cumulonimbus clouds building up. And then in the center, you can see the radial pattern on the bubbles in the water. And then I'm showing you on the ground that you can find formations of sandstone that look like this. They're rounded bumps. I actually, we climbed all, all over one of those out in the middle of Utah. And down on the left, I uh, built a campfire and the billowing smoke that comes out is in rounded puffs. And we've all seen that many a time. 
Over on the right, I also tried to draw a maple grove um, cluster of trees out in the middle of Utah. And if, from a distance, the rounded tops, again, take on this same radial shape that comes from uh, flow patterns. In chapter nine of my book, we're camped in the Rocky Mountains at Haviland Lake, north of Durango, a favorite fishing spot. And it, I pull out my paints and set up, set up on the picnic table. <laughs> my classroom palette doesn't fit what I've been seeing. The student pigments that I was trained to buy are not true to this landscape, except for an occasional wildflower. The colors are too bright. The sage, junipers, conifers, rocky outcrops, and distant mountains all challenge my color sense. Western outdoor colors are more muted, even earthy. I ponder new choices. I experiment with colors. What suits this landscape? I work wet on wet with different blues and reds. Aha, Prussian blue, one of my favorites. And I mix it with cadmium red, and it turns into a useful Payne's gray that works for storm clouds. A mixed color is more versatile than straight tube color. Mixed colors may separate on the page or shift in value, which makes interesting combinations. Controlling it is another matter, but this gives me two primary colors for outdoors, but I still need a yellow. A couple days later, I take my art pack down to the lake boat ramp and find a place to paint. I pick up my brush and experiment. So much is involved. The breeze ripples the water in an all-over pattern of dancing lights. I make a mental note to add ripples to my list of patterns. The breeze strengthens and the ripples line up into parallel waves. The forest is dark green. The dry grass has a special pale yellow color. Can I make them look right on paper? Still looking for the perfect yellow to complete my triad of primary colors for outdoors, I pull out a tube of raw sienna, one of the earth colors. It looks right for the dry grasses on the bank. I try mixing raw sienna with Prussian blue, and it turns into a rich forest green perfect for the conifers around the lake. Aha, I have found my yellow. It works well for this landscape. Well, painting the ripples on that lake was pretty interesting because the breeze started from one side of the lake and then by the time I was through, it was coming from the other side. So I got quite an interesting pattern. And uh, my, interestingly, when I got home, my art teacher <laughs> interpreted that for me. He could say he, he could see where some of it was coming from the left and some was coming from the right. But it's a matter of shadows and water patterns on the surface of the water and you'll see some of them are rounded and others are just making that wave pattern, that ridge of water that comes um, the way <laughs> waves do. After my fascination with waterways and all the ripples and waves in the Rockies, we got out to the canyon country, and to my surprise, I, Don found a piece of ripplestone on one of his hikes. And ripplestone is sandstone that has ripples in it. And of course, it's caused uh, from thousands of years ago when the ripples were in sand only and water was flowing right across it in such a way that the ripples became fairly um, hard and fairly permanent, but what really made them turn into rock was some kind of upheaval um, geologically and they got covered up at just the right moment and, and then they were pressed into rock over eons of time. It's fun to see there are ripples everywhere, in the ground, in the sky, and to have the ripple stone, it was just a great um, addition to our travels. So I came home with this notion that the whole earth is involved in flow, the air currents, the land movement, the waterways. It's just another aspect of how earth systems are connected, how unified they are. Unity, it all works together, and we're a part of it. This sort of discovery generates a natural reverence for the outdoor world. And that natural reverence that happens is recognized in all major religions. And it leads to faith for some, and it leads to gratitude and respect. And if we take care of it, it leads to restoration. So I've been asked the question, can you find God outdoors? 
the being behind nature, the hidden wholeness of Thomas Merton. Well, for me, the mystery is there, the peace and the presence. I'd like to finish by reading uh, from the book again. We're in the Rocky Mountains, and it tells uh, how I feel about the painting process. When I start to draw each line and contour, render the important characteristics, place each marker, emphasize dramatic features, capture the textures, by the time I'm done, I feel like I know the very essence of my subject. The lines become part of my image vocabulary, while the contours and gestures stay with me. I close my eyes and can still sense the form of the mountain, the textured forest cover, the escarpments, even the snow patches. I will remember the peace that floods through me as I work, the peace that enfolds this whole community of life. I can sense it right here and now as I set my stool in the shade and pull out my sketchbook. I love these mountains. So this is how we reconnected with nature. Read my book, The Road to Beaver Park, Painting, Perception, and Pilgrimage. It's all in there waiting to help you on your own journey of discovery. Mm -hmm.